Was that good enough? What do you think? So Brian, I don't know if you know this. Brian is a very sophisticated man, so he prefers like the snap. You know, like you go to a jazz bar and there's like a cool band. So everybody, can we do a round of a snap real quick? Come on, a little bit more, and then can we do one more? Because I know Brian likes to have fun too. Can we give him a round of applause like this? Can we make some noise for Brian? Let's thank him for being here this morning. Thank you, Brian. Hey. Well, um, thank you. I think for that introduction. Um, no pressure there, <laughs> but I do want to say good morning, and uh, let me be the 134th person since Wednesday to wish you a happy new year. So, um, I want to thank all of you for being here this morning, and um, it's great to see so many faces at the beginning of the year here at our first, first worship service of the year. Um, also, I'd like to thank the NFL uh, for scheduling the Seahawks game for later this afternoon, <laughs> so that we can all go see them beat Philadelphia together, right? Okay. So here we are in 2020. Now, personally, I don't hold much stock in New Year's resolutions, but I do get excited at the new year because it gives us a chance to reflect on what we've done and even more importantly on, on where we can go. So as I was walking through the last couple of weeks and praying and trying to figure out what God wanted me to share with you, um, it dawned on me one thing that I think is critically important. And whether you're recently just a, a recent new believer or if you've been a believer for 40 years, this New Year's gives us a chance and an opportunity to focus on who we are in Christ. So if you haven't yet made a life-changing decision to follow Jesus Christ, I'm hoping that the message that we talk through today will help you understand what that relationship offers. So Jesus Christ offers us each a new life, a new identity. So I think it's fitting to start off this brand new year with one critical question that we should all be asking of ourselves. It's one that needs to be answered. And that is, who are you? What is your true identity? You see, who you are determines how you live. And let me say that one more time. Who you are determines how you live. Now, who we think we are may not, in fact, be who we are. And a false identity, that which we believe ourselves that isn't true, poses a difficult challenge to living the life Jesus has called each of us to do. If we have a wrong identity, it can actually cripple us. So let's start. Let's start this morning by taking a quick look at who we are not. The false identities, if you will, that all of us have from time to time. Now, when someone asks you for the first time, when they ask you who you are, what is your typical response? When somebody says, well, tell me a little bit about yourself. What are the kinds of things that we think of? What are the things that you usually hear? Is it something like this? Is it, I'm Susie's dad? I'm Robert's wife. I'm the vice president of widgets and thingamajigs. Or maybe it's, I'm a Mariner fan. As important as all of these may be to us, these are not who we are. These are not identities. These are roles we play. See, who you are is not determined by the various roles that each of us play. Likewise, the false feelings that we often have about ourselves are not who we are. Many struggle with thoughts of being inept or unworthy, unwanted, or just plain bad. As I talk with people and as I understand and work through their lives together, I hear things like, I think I'm ugly, I'm shameful, I'm unlovable. You see, we often cling to the scars of past abuse or oppressive relationships. And so we often define ourselves by these negative thoughts that we have about ourselves because of past experiences. Those clouded lies that the enemy continually bombards us with. That is not our identity. Or we compare ourselves with others. I don't know about you, I do this. People who seemingly have it all together, but they secretly harbor the same insecurities and the same lies as ourselves. And so we try and project a persona, this facade that we hope makes us look better to the rest of the world, the rest of the community. 
But people, it's hard to know your true identity when your only other source of input is what people are pasting on Facebook or Twitter. Finally, we allow old sins and habits to haunt us, allowing them to define us for who we are. We're often unwilling to forgive ourselves and we're crippled by memories of things long gone. Focusing instead on a false identity created by the one who accuses us day and night. But when we're in Christ, he's washed all of that away. All we need to do is accept that. 2 Corinthians 5.17 sums up this truth about each of us in one very concise statement. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. The new has come. What a great message for the beginning of a new year, of a new decade. And so I'll ask again, if you've not experienced this forgiveness, the new life in Christ that he offers and he brings, I want you to listen carefully now what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is what a relationship with Jesus offers everybody. Scripture says, Do not be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Were some of you. Past tense. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Those are our past lives. People, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, but if you don't know who you are, you will not experience in this life the best of what God created you for. Let God determine. Let God reveal to you who you are. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. God tells us this in Jeremiah. You see, God created each one of you. He created me. He knows who we are. So why do we let the cares of the world and the lies of the enemy blind us to this reality? Now, on the other hand, when we do realize who God says we are and we accept that, we can experience the power of Jesus in our lives beyond any wildest expectation. So let me show you an example of what I'm talking about here from the Old Testament. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Judges. Take a look at the story of Gideon. Uh, we're going to begin in Judges chapter 6 and begin with verse 1. Is everyone there? Okay. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel, and because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels would not be counted so that they laid waste to the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. So that sets the stage here. Midian was destroying Israel, and there was nobody that was able to stand. The people were hiding in caves and dens, the rocks and the mountains to escape, all while their enemy destroyed everything they had. Imagine the discouragement, the hunger, the defeat, the inability to act. Well, what was God's answers to their cries? Well, skipping down to verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite, 
while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? Where are all the wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to Gideon and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do I not send you? So what does God say Gideon is? Who does he say Gideon is? What is Gideon's identity? God sees him as a mighty warrior who will save Israel. A mighty man of valor. This is Gideon's true identity. And this is not a new development. This is how God made him. This is what God made him for. Sadly, who does Gideon think he is? Well, continuing in the text, starting at verse 15, Gideon said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. But the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Gideon sees himself as weak, impotent, insignificant, and powerless. Why? Because of his circumstances, because of a false identity that he believes about himself. So the Lord finds Gideon hiding in the bottom of a wine press, totally clueless of his true identity. And yet in reality, he was a mighty warrior. And so it is with us. See, we often allow our circumstances and our experiences and then our insecurities cloud us from seeing ourselves as we really are, as God has created us. And of course, we know, we know the rest of the story over the next four chapters, Gideon routes the Midianites and restores Israel. And you see, once he understood who he was, he was able to trust God, work with God, and God worked powerfully in his life through his true identity. See, again, it's the same for each of us. If God is not working in a powerful way in our lives, well, it may just be that we're working out of one of these false identities and not who God says we are. The Bible gives us several examples of men and women whose lives were changed dramatically once they embraced the identity that God gave them, their true identity. Gideon isn't the only example here. Moses saw himself as what? A sheep herder who didn't speak well. But God knew he was the one who would lead Israel out of captivity. Paul saw himself as a murderer of Christians. God knew that he was an apostle who would write multiple books of our New Testament. Peter saw himself as what? A poor fisherman. Jesus knew that he would be a foundation for his church. You see, each of us has an identity that God has given to us. He created us. He molded us. And who we are is completely unique from every other person who has ever lived on this earth. Our unique identity comes from God. In fact, Revelation 2.18 tells us that each of us who persevere in Christ, who stick through Jesus through thick and thin, each of us has a unique identity that is given to us. And this identity is known only by God and by us. Listen to what it says in Revelation. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Let me ask you. Do you know what your identity is? Do you know, do you live who you are in Christ? I'm going to suggest this morning 
I'm suggesting that there are two answers to this question for us. The first, your singularly unique identity, that special name that God has given you, this can only be surmised between you and God. It's not something we can discover in today's sermon. It takes much individual prayer and fellowship and time with God himself. It's relationship with God. More on that a little later. The second answer is this. In order to find that unique identity, that unique call God has placed on your life, well, first, we must understand who you are, who we all are in Christ Jesus. We must be willing to give up our false identities and those lies and false beliefs that the world would have us believe. We have to replace this false identity with our identity in Christ. Replace it with that Christ has given every single believer. So if you're ready, I'm going to take a brief look at how God sees us, how it is that God defines us through the eyes of Jesus. So if you've given your life over to Jesus, here are just a few of the new traits that make up who you are. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. You've been specifically chosen by God. God loves you so much that he's chosen you to be a part of his eternal kingdom. We are holy and blameless in him. We've been adopted as a son of God. You're now a family member. You've been redeemed. Jesus has purchased you for himself with his blood. His death and resurrection has paid for your freedom. You are no longer under bondage. And you've been forgiven. All of your sins, past, present, and even future, have been forgiven. You've been lavished with his grace. You've obtained an eternal inheritance. You were predestined for this from eternity, even before you were born. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. And you've received the guarantee of spending eternity with God. Think about those for a minute. Is this enough to get excited about? I hope so. So you say, Brian, well, do you have a verse for that? Well, yeah, I do. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, this is a lot of material, so I'm going to go through it quickly. You can follow along or you can listen. But the first chapter of Ephesians is one of the richest passages in all of Scripture about who we are in Christ. So read along with me or listen as I highlight parts of this passage, starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will and to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses and according to the riches of his grace, which he has lavished on us. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his promise, who works all things after the counsel of his will to the end, that we who are the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Amen? Now, that's a lot. I understand that's a lot to go through, and that's why I'm going to recommend that this is a part of Scripture that you want to continue studying constantly because this is a great example of who we are in Christ of who God sees us as. 
See, if you're in Christ, this is how God sees you. This is your true identity. You're pure, you're blameless, and forgiven. You've received the hope of spending eternity with God. Most of all, when we're in Christ, these aspects of our new identity can never be altered or changed. They are who we are. Instead of being rejected, we've been accepted. Instead of being in bondage, we're redeemed. Instead of being subject to the law, we're covered by grace. And instead of feeling orphaned, we've been adopted. This is cause for celebration. So who you are determines how you live. Each of us has a choice as to who we believe we are, right? We can believe a false identity that the world or our adversary has conditioned us to believe, or we can believe who God tells us we are. And you know what? I get it. It's a constant battle as we live in a world that seeks to define us in its own standards, not God's. And the lies we repeat to ourselves over and over again in our head continually move us away from the person God knows we are. Living out one of these false identities instead of living in our new identity affects our behaviors in some very damaging ways. It puts us right back into the bondage that Jesus delivered us from. We might think we have to do more for God in order to be right for him. We might submerge ourselves in work or service or good works to feel as though we're worthy of what he's done for us or in order to be in good standing with him instead of resting in Christ's work on the cross. We may find ourselves playing to others' perceptions of who they think we are rather than focusing on what God has called us to do. Nothing good comes from having a false identity. However, if we live our life based on the identity of who God says we are, we'll no longer feel the need to find our worth in our external circumstances or others' opinions. Living in our identity in Christ frees us to live in confidence and in a stable manner instead of morphing who we are based on the jobs we get or lose, the personas others box us into, the personas we create for ourselves to present an image, the negative messages we tell ourselves, and all the other ways we try and define our significance. Our significance is in God. Living our identity in Christ gives us the opportunity to experience God's unconditional love for us in new and fresh ways every day. Gives us the, it gives us the luster to accomplish things we could never dream of. And it gives us courage to confidently and <clears throat> boldly share his love with others. The choice is ours. See, as we move into 2020, I'd like to challenge each of us to make today critical decisions. First, if you've not yet received the salvation that Jesus Christ offers, the new life that he has to give us, why not? Today's a perfect time to receive your newfound identity in Jesus. In fact, we'll be celebrating communion here in a little bit later in our service. What a wonderful way it would be for you to celebrate for the first time as a new believer in Christ. Will you join us? If you're already a believer, I want to challenge you today to determine once and for all who you are. Are you willing to give up the false identities we cling to and grab hold of the person that God has made you to be, the person that God says you are? So there are four action items I want to suggest that will help us with this challenge this year. First, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Each time you feel confused about who you are, read it. Each time you struggle with a false identity creeping up, go back and read what Jesus says about who you really are in this first chapter. Focus on God's word rather than on your circumstances or what the world would have you become or what you 
want to pretend to become. Trust me, God's word is a much better source for learning your identity than Facebook. Second, pray. Go directly to the source of your identity and ask him. Hebrews 4.16 gives us these instructions. Let us come with confidence and draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. What are we afraid of? God is asking us to come to him in confidence. He wants us to go directly to him. Spend time in genuine, fervent fellowship with him. It's okay to give up your time on Twitter. He will tell you what your identity is. I'm thinking he's a much better resource than Joel Osteen. So let's each spend time in prayer with the one who created us, the one whose identity is in us. I'm sorry, the one whose our identity is in him. Third, join a small group. Groups are starting as soon as next week. Uh, it's a great way to not only connect with other believers, it gives us all a chance to hold each other accountable and work through our challenges together. We're always stronger in unity. Number four, I'd ask you to join us for our next series as Pastor Lincoln guides us through the entire Bible. Every Sunday for the next few months, we'll be focusing on over 4,000 years of God pursuing humanity, sharing his love for mankind, and offering each of us our salvation and reconciliation with him. 2020 has the potential to be an awesome year for each of us. We can spend the year believing the worst about ourselves, believing a lie and a false identity, and hiding in a pit, feeling helpless and hopeless like Gideon. Or we can be a conqueror in Christ by agreeing with him what our true identity is, our identity in him, and we can be a conqueror. Choice is up to you. What is your identity? Who are you? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, first of all, this morning that in this beginning of the new year, that we have an opportunity to come and be with one another and worship you, to worship you publicly, to read your word, and to just enjoy your fellowship. Lord, for any who are here that do not yet know the love and the experience and the joy of seeing you as their Lord and Savior, Father, I pray that they will join us today. And for each of us, I pray that you will put in our hearts and in our minds our identity in you. Lord, focus on who we are in you rather than the mold of the world. We lift this up to you this morning, Lord. We praise you and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.